continues on TNN. By the age of 15, Keith Whitley and Ricky Skaggs had become the talk of the bluegrass world. They were asked to open a concert for one of their heroes, Ralph Stanley. They were singing and playing when Ralph got there, and he'd just come in and sit down on the front row and listen to him. And he was just amazed by it because anything that he asked them to do of his and Carter's old songs, they could do it. Now, Mr. Roosevelt told me just how he felt when he heard that the brown going through. If your liquor's too red, it'll swell up your head. You better stick to that good old mountain dew. Both on it, that old mountain dew, 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 and I'm glad if you're dead, I'll do, do, do. I'll hook up my mug if you'll fill up my jug with a good old In 1970, Ralph Stanley invited both 15-year-olds to join his band, the Clinch Mountain Boys. Ralph called Keith the most talented singer he'd ever worked with. They toured with Ralph's group for the next two years. It was a sudden adult dose of the spotlight. And being on the road so young, touring as far away as Japan had its price for Keith. It was as a teenager that Keith first started drinking heavily. He saw things that probably a 15-year-old shouldn't see, you know. When you're on the road with uh, an adult band, you know, it's, uh, uh, of course, Ralph was like a father to Keith, and, and I'm sure he took good care of him and watched over him and Ricky both. But still, you know, you, you worry about them when they're on the road. You know, when you play like a bluegrass festival, you've always got a friend there that, that's going to hand you a beer or a drink or something when you come off stage, and it's available. And a 15-year-old is not mature enough, you know, to say no. And I'm sure Keith, you know, that was probably when he started and when he probably developed the problem was during those years. He was always with older people. And uh, that was one thing that I, I look back on and think that, you know, I wish maybe he could have been with people his own age more, but... Everybody that was in the music business was older than him, and he just had to be with them. And he just seemed like he grew up so fast. This was Keith's room, and he loved it so much. Of course, it was quite different when he was here. He had more guitars and things in here, but this is a guitar that he brought me. And uh, he said, don't forget how to play and keep this until I call for it. So it was very important to him, and he used it on a lot of his records. And it had been uh, to a couple of trips to Japan. And that's a picture of one of his heroes there. Elvis was one of his heroes. He loved him very much. Every morning I'd knock on his door and I'd say, Are you ready for your coffee? I'd bring his coffee to him. And at night, if he was real, if he come in and he was real tired, I always massaged his shoulders till he went to sleep. But if he come in and I was asleep, he always come to my room to let me know he was home. And if he thought I was asleep, he'd pinch my toe. <laughs> I'm home, Mom. Keith spent five years on and off playing with Ralph Stanley's group. But by the time he reached his early 20s, Keith was beginning to look beyond bluegrass. He was yearning to sing more in the straight, country honky-tonk style of his hero Lefty Frizzell. Keith had these dreams of being able to play real country, sing real country music with a steel guitar and a piano and all things that he didn't have access to in the bluegrass world, you know. Um, a drummer. <laughs> things like that. In 1978, he joined the band J.D. Crow and the New South blended traditional and modern styles of country music. Around this time, Keith was earning a word-of-mouth reputation in Nashville as a real musician's musician. I said, this guy is like the cat's pajamas. You have to hear this. This is real country music. This is what it's all about. And uh, that's how we got acquainted, because uh, I was a fan. So we, uh, through one means or another, a bunch of us here in Nashville encouraged him to move to, to Nashville. Keith, now married to his Kentucky sweetheart, Kathy, did decide in the early 1980s to move to Nashville, where his friend Ricky Skaggs had already made it big. But Keith found that money and bookings were both scarce. He 
was basically starving to death, and uh, <laughs> he had no ready source of income. So every now and again, my wife and I would invite him and his then wife Kathy over and feed them spaghetti and talk about country music and what we loved, and and that's how we became friends. For a country traditionalist like Keith. It was not the best time to arrive in town. At the time that Keith really came on the scene in Nashville, country music was going through such a big change where we didn't know if bluegrass was considered country or pop was considered country or really back then country was not happening. I mean it wasn't wasn't cool. But I think with Keith he felt like they didn't want that from the heart thing. It was, uh, we need up-tempo, we need catchy lyric, we need catchy uh, titles, and I think that was very um, distressing to Keith. It was a tough time for a young man who'd always secretly doubted his own ability. Keith never really knew how good he was. And he never really knew how many friends that he had and how many people was behind him. He never really knew that. I wish he could have known him more. He was always afraid that, that he wouldn't please somebody else. He always looked at it that way. Keith was a bundle of self-doubt. Um, there was, he was outwardly incredibly charming and very, very funny but inwardly was a scared boy. And Nashville can be very intimidating when you're from a little town called Sandy Hook, Kentucky. And I don't think he ever really, really got over that feeling of, of maybe I'm not good enough. Those close to Keith believe this self-doubt might have propelled him into his occasional damaging drinking binges. I think Keith turned to alcohol uh, because of his confidence. He, he lacked confidence in himself, and uh, possibly that would give him more confidence. I think he saw where all the great singers have been before him. And that's his George Jones, and Lefty Frizzell, Hank Williams. All these people were considered great. They all were known for their drinking. And I think that part scared him. I think in a way, Keith didn't think he deserved success. It's almost like Keith was always trying to punish himself or something. Keith was also haunted by the loss of his older brother, Randy was killed on his motorbike near the family home in 1983. Keith didn't like to deal with problems and that was such a tragedy because it was the first time in our family that anything had happened like that and uh, I think that uh, I don't believe he ever dealt with it. I think that Randy's death contributed to a lot of his problems. Although Keith had his problems and self-doubt, no one in Nashville doubted that one of the great country voices had arrived in town. Soon he would make the breakthrough he dreamed of since childhood. The life and times of Keith Whitley returns in a moment on TNN.